Good evening. Welcome to the Pinnacle Church of Christ for the second watch of the day. We appreciate you tuning in and joining our Sunday night sermon as we live stream uh, to Little Rock, to Malvern, to Searcy, to all of the places that you would want to be. We're thankful that you've tuned in, that you're giving primacy to the Word of God, to the preaching of His Word this evening as we tackle the subject, Render Unto Caesar. Before we get into that, our text will be Matthew chapter 22. You can start turning there. Let's ask God's blessing upon our deliberations this evening. Our God and our Father, we recognize you as the giver and sustainer of life, as the originator of every good and perfect gift. And Father, we see that you are truly the king of the universe and the king of our lives. Father, as we think about the words of your son this evening, we pray that you will give us insight, that you give us wisdom, and that you'll give us the determination to put these lessons into practice in our lives. Be with those that could not be with us today on the first day of the week, those that are struggling with illness and bereavement and problems of various types. Father, we pray that you bless accordingly as only you can. We ask these blessings and favors in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The hostility toward teaching our children about religion, and especially Christianity, is strange when you consider that the whole of Western civilization has been constructed either on Christianity or on the Judeo-Christian principles from whence it comes. The problem today is not that our young people know too little uh, about these things. It's that they know virtually nothing about these things. Contemporary America is a religiously illiterate society in which the Bible is rarely taught. Many cannot name five of the Ten Commandments or recognize Genesis as the first book of the Bible. There's no point in asking about the meaning of the Trinity because some know virtually nothing about that. One in 10 Americans apparently believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Ignorance of this type has made many Westerners virtually clueless about the literature, history, and philosophy that has made the West the civilization it is today. Another group of people are more familiar than this of history, but mistakenly believe that the pinnacle of Western civilization happened to be ancient Greece and Rome. The classical world, they sigh, was destroyed by Christianity and those barbarians who then plunged the world into the Dark Ages. Fortunately, in this thinking, the world was saved by the free thinkers of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, which opened our eyes to the wonders of modern science, the marketing system of creating wealth, and modern democracy. The truth is that Christianity formed a foundational pillar of Western civilization. Actually, the West has been built upon two pillars, Athens and Jerusalem. And by Jerusalem, we mean Judaism and Christianity. It is the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition that made Western civilization unique. Classical civilization was plagued by barbarous practices like pederasty, slavery, and exposing infants. When Rome collapsed from within, due to its own decadence and weakness, it was overrun by barbarians like the Huns, the Goths, the Vandals, and the Visigoths. Over time, these people would be converted to Christianity and civilized. So Christianity took this backward continent and gave it learning and order, stability, and dignity. Monasteries preserved the learning of later antiquity. And through the years, savage barbarian warriors became chivalrous Christian knights. 
and new ideals of civility and manners and romance were formed that continue to shape our society down to the present day. Christianity on many levels is responsible for the way our society is organized and for the way that we currently live. So extensive is the Christian contribution to our laws, our economics, our politics, our arts, our calendar, our holidays, and our moral and cultural priorities that the historian J.M. Roberts in The Triumph of the Christian West says the following, We could none of us today be what we are if a handful of Jews nearly 2,000 years ago had not believed that they had known a great teacher, seen him crucified, dead and buried, and then rise again. These foundational facts have made Western civilization unique. But the influence of Christianity is seen in virtually every area of Western life and history. And we don't have to travel beyond these United States to see some vivid examples of this. Let's consider a few in the next few moments. Go to the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Every session of the House and Senate begins with prayer. Each house has its own chaplain. The 83rd Congress set aside a small room in the Capitol just off the rotunda for the private prayers and meditation of Congress. This room is always open when Congress is in session, but is not open to the public. The room's focal point is a stained glass window showing George Washington kneeling in prayer. Behind him is etched these words from the 16th Psalm. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. If you move a little bit away from the Capitol and go to the Supreme Court, you'll find this. Above the head of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court are the Ten Commandments, with the great American eagle protecting them. The sculpture on the east front includes Moses, the lawgiver, because so many of American laws find their antecedents in the ancient law of Moses. The crier who opens each session closes with the words, God save the United States and the honorable court. If you move from the Supreme Court to the Library of Congress, You'll note that there are, within the library, numerous quotations from Scripture that can be found within its walls. One reminds each American of his responsibility to his maker. From Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 are inscribed these words, What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. If you were to move away from the Library of Congress, you would see the Jefferson Memorial. And on the south banks of Washington's tidal basin, Thomas Jefferson still speaks. God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Likely in these words is the conflict that Jefferson and so many of the founders felt about the peculiar institution of slavery, recognizing on the one hand that all men are created equal, even at the same time when there were a class of men whom they treated decidedly as unequal. And Jefferson here is referencing the fact that God's justice one day will reign. 
But even with that, the man who was most likely given credit uh, for the notion of the separation of church and state, which we'll talk about in just a moment, he would have recognized that it wouldn't be out of place to have prayers given anytime a new president is inaugurated. When Barack Obama was inaugurated as our nation's 44th president, a minister by the name of Rick Warren stepped to the podium and offered yet another reminder of the Christian foundation of these United States. And even as atheists everywhere seethed that a Christian was up praying to a God in whom they did not believe, Warren mentioned the president and his wife and his two daughters by name and asked God's blessing upon the first family and upon the nation that Obama was leading. That's something I hope that never goes away, that we can always ask God to bless our nation, to bless our nation's leaders. But in the United States, it's common to think of the idea of the separation of religion on one hand and the government on the other that goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. But here's a notion. It goes back a little further than Jefferson. It actually goes all the way back to Jesus himself. Listen to these words taken from Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, press pause for just a moment. They're buttering Jesus up the way Eddie Haskell always buttered up Mrs. Cleaver. These are words that are just soaked in insincerity. They're basically just trying to trap Jesus. So when they're asking for his opinion on this great question, here's why this is such a good question if what you're doing is trying to lay a trap for Jesus. There's no answer that's going to be given that's not going to drive people into a frenzy. Because if Jesus says, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, they're going to say, you see, he's a turncoat. He's a sellout. He's collaborating with the hated, occupying foreign Roman government. But if Jesus, on the other hand, says, no, it's not right to pay taxes to Caesar, then these ancient Eddie Haskells run to the occupying Romans and say, this man is stirring up the people. He's a traitor. He's seditious. So there's no answer, they think, that Jesus is going to give to this question that's, that's going to save his skin. And yet, notice what Jesus does. Jesus, knowing their evil intent, says, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The words of Jesus inspired Augustine to write the city of God. And in this great work, he argued that during our time here on earth, the Christian occupies two different realms. We live partly in the city of men on earth where we dwell. We dwell partly in the city of God in whose image that we are made. And only at the end of time will God integrate these two in a single majestic kingdom he rules. In the meantime, we have different duties. Ultimately, our devotion is given to the city of God. 
But on earth, we're under the governments of men that have limits beyond which they cannot go. Now, don't miss this point. The idea of limited government recognizes that the sanctuary of conscience inside each person is protected from political control and asserts that there are some things that the government cannot control. There are certain things that belong to Caesar. There are other things that belong to God. So the creator of the universe then grants authority to the earthly city to exercise dominion over its sphere. This sense of limited government included a degree of religious toleration that was not just unusual for its time, it was virtually unheard of for its time. If you went back to America in its early days, in colonial America, Puritans predominated in Massachusetts. They had basically run Roger Williams out of Massachusetts, so Williams and his fellow Baptists ended up leading Rhode Island. Anglicans were the majority in Virginia, while Maryland was a Catholic stronghold. Ultimately, the various groups agreed to leave the central government out of religion. So the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment was passed largely with Christian support. The genius of the American founders was to go beyond tolerance to insist that central government stay completely out of the business of theology. Have you ever wondered why there's a Church of England, there's a Church of Sweden, there's a Church of so many of those countries from whence many American immigrants came? There's no Church of America. There isn't one. The majority of the, of the founders were devout Christians. Some, like Jefferson, were deists. But all of them, whether they realized it or not, were following Christ's rule to keep the domains of Caesar and God separate. It was an experiment that has worked very well for nearly a quarter of a millennia. Their idea was never to insulate central government from the province of morality. In fact, they insisted that morality was indispensable for this new form of government to succeed. Our first president, George Washington, said this, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Washington said you take religion away, morality goes with it. Are we not seeing that in many quarters of society today? Yeah, we are. John Adams said this, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So people that want to worship the Constitution, the reason the Constitution works, it assumes a strong belief in God. You take that strong belief in God away and we become a bickering group of people with different and special interests that seemingly have very little in common. When Alexis de Tocqueville, the Frenchman, visited America in the early 19th century, he was amazed at the way the different religious groups all preached the same moral law in the name of God. He saw Christianity as countering the powerful human instincts of selfishness and ambition by holding out an ideal of charity and devotion to the welfare of others. Today, courts too often wrongly interpret the separation of church and state to mean that religion should have no role whatsoever in the public arena, or that morality derived from religion should not be allowed to shape our laws. Here's the problem with that. Secularists want to impose on the public square of religion and religious-based morality their own agenda. 
So it's not a question, is morality uh, going to have a role in the public sphere? Of course it is. Whose morality is it going to be? Is it going to be a morality that has been around for 2,000 years, or is it going to be a rather uh, recently derived morality from secular humanism? The separation of the realms should not be used as a weapon against Christianity. We live in a pluralistic society. So what that means in real terms, Christians are not going to go ahead and shove their views down the throats of everyone else. That's not the kind of country that we inhabit. But nor is it the kind of country, and nor was it ever intended to be, the kind of place where Christians have no voice whatsoever. That's not what the founders intended. Rather, it's an idea supplied by Christianity to promote social peace, religious freedom, and a moral community. When our country has worked well, it's held these three things as sacred obligations. If we were to recover the concept, as taught by Jesus, of different spheres of responsibility, of rendering to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God, our society would be much better off. And probably there would be a lot less bickering and fighting. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's close by going to him in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the society in which we live, for the country in which our citizenship rests. And Father, we recognize that in so many instances, we have been given so many blessings. Father, at the same time, we recognize that our country is not and has never been perfect. And where there have been wrongs, where there have been inconsistencies, where there have been hypocrisies, Father, in so many instances, our society and our people have paid a heavy price. Father, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our president, for our senators, for the House of Representatives, for our governor, for our mayor, for all of these who have the burden of leadership and responsibility. Father, we pray that they'll make wise decisions. We pray that they'll recognize the rights of all of the people. And Father, we pray that the voice of Christians is always heard and it always has an influence in bringing people back to your plan for our lives. Father, we pray your blessings upon this country and upon all countries. We pray for peace on earth. And Father, we pray where there is wickedness, where there is violence, where there is selfishness, that those urges will be defeated. And Father, that the world can know the Prince of Peace, in whose name we pray. Amen.